guys, welcome back to my channel. Today's video is going to be about three biblical and tangible ways to combat anxiety. If you are a human being and you have a pulse, you've probably dealt with anxiety in some way in some time period of your life. I don't think that anybody's immune from it or immune to it. And if you're somebody like me who has dealt with both depression and anxiety, not the kind of like daily anxiety or situational anxiety, but like continual perpetual anxiety over a long period of time, or maybe you've dealt with it your whole life, it doesn't matter what kind or what type or how much or how little of anxiety that you've dealt with, these things can be practical to you and they can be applied to you because anxiety across the board is something that we can battle and we should battle against no matter how strong it feels. But I think that it's both a command and an encouragement to take a look at what the Bible says about anxiety and apply it to our lives in a way that we can actually like live it out in a way that we can actually go to battle against the things that the enemy is trying to use against us because if we just label ourselves well i'm just anxious or like i won't ever get over this or i won't ever be able to m even manage this then like of course the enemy's gonna allow you to believe that and like i said i know that there are people who are like who continuously struggle with anxiety and it's a deeper level and it, it has to go beyond just people saying things to you like well just be happy or just choose joy or just get over it because people have said that to me before and I've heard other people say that to people who struggle with anxiety really really bad and that's not helpful at all like you can't just go to somebody and say just choose happiness without leading them somewhere else also just using that blanket statement and just saying just choose happiness or just choose joy or just get over it or just practice gratitude all of those things by themselves are like great but you have to have a reason behind why and a reason why you're battling and a reason why you need to fight and you need to choose those things and that's what i want to just like uncover today and explore today i also just want to say that anxiety is not limited to non-believers you can 100 percent be a christian and suffer with anxiety. In fact, I know a lot of Christians who suffer with anxiety or who suffer with depression, and it's a very real thing. You can struggle with the same things. The difference is, is that when we are in Jesus, we have this battle plan. We have this person who stands at the front lines for us, who has already declared victory, and who we know that when we're fighting these battles, these everyday battles against anxiety, because it is an everyday battle, that we know we already have the victory at the end of it all because Jesus on the cross said it is finished and we have this hope in Jesus that whatever we're suffering with on this earth whatever we are struggling with whether it's something like anxiety or pain or whatever has happened in our lives we have this greater hope and that's the difference all right so what we are going to look at today is a passage that is probably like the most quoted scripture around anxiety if pastors preach about it on the topic of anxiety and maybe your friend has sent you the scripture when it's talking about anxiety it's just kind of the go-to because it's the clearest example and that the bible gives of like this is what you should do with anxiety and this is why you should shouldn't be anxious philippians 4 4 through 7 and it says rejoice in the lord always i will say it again rejoice let your gentleness be evident to all the lord is near do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We're going a little bit more. I said four through seven, but we're going to go four through nine. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things things whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me put into practice and the god of peace will be with you out of that entire passage of scripture that we just read i picked out three different practical biblical action plans to combat anxiety and the first one is rejoice it is the very first thing that philippians 4 4 says it says rejoice always and then paul repeats it again he says i will say it again rejoice 
always. When I was studying this scripture and when I was like trying to pick it apart a little bit and, and apply it to my life, the, the two things that stood out to me the most is that he doesn't just say rejoice sometimes. He says rejoice always, which means there's no, there's no time limit. There's no expiration date. It is continual. It is always. And the second thing is that he repeats it. So if you weren't listening the first time or if you didn't get it the first time, he's going to repeat it again. And something that you should take note of when you're reading the Bible, this is just like a little side tip, is that if the Bible ever repeats something, which I'm going to talk about again in a second, you should take notice of it. The Bible doesn't repeat things just for kicks and giggles. It repeats things because it's necessary to take notice of and to dive deeper into or to ask the question of why is this repeated? I looked up what the definition of rejoice meant because I don't, I mean, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm like, this is a simple word that we like Christian, it's like Christianese that we use all the time, but like, what does that actually mean? So when I looked it up, it says that rejoice means to feel or show great joy or delight. So as soon as I read that, it kind of like opened my eyes to what the whole rejoice always means because in itself, rejoice all always seems like a tangible thing. It seems like in every situation you're going to rejoice. But I wanted to take it a little bit farther and say, what does rejoice actually look like? What is rejoicing in the world? I mean, rejoicing in the Lord, not the world, <laughs> look like? For me, practically. So when it says it's to, sh to feel or to show joy, great joy, I started thinking about all the ways that the Bible says to choose joy or what joy is. So joy is unconditional. Happiness is conditional. As believers, we are not called to live a life of happiness. We're not, we're not called to pursue happiness. We're called to pursue Jesus and Jesus is joy. I realized that joy is the fruit of the spirit. And I was like, how cool is that? That like rejoice always means to show or to feel great joy. And joy is the fruit of the spirit. So basically what's that, what that's saying is that to be in the spirit means to have joy, love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And joy is a part of that. What that means is that when I am choosing to live out of the spirit and in the spirit of God and not in the world, not in my flesh, not in what I'm thinking about or what I am scared of or what I'm worrying about. But when I choose to have a spiritual, a, a spirit filled perspective, then I'm able to live out joy. I'm not able to do that just with me alone because joy is a fruit of the spirit. It's what, when the spirit is in me and when the spirit is is working and when is he's thriving and when he's um, planting these seeds in me I have a heart that is is good soil then I'm able to live out of a place of joy what I also saw which was cool when I actually wrote down the word rejoice I was like whoa 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 so if you take the re and you take the joyce and you like separate them you see that re is to like do something again right and joyce is like a way of saying joy. So when I separated them and I looked at them, I was like, I'm reminding myself what joy is. And so the very first one, the very first action plan, what I got from that is that to rejoice always means to remind myself what joy is, what it looks like and how I can live it out. I have to remind myself all the time that joy in the midst of suffering is possible, but it's not its not ever gonna be by me trying harder, by me trying to be happier or trying to be more joyful. It's always going to be me remaining and rooting deeper in Christ. And, and what that looks like is spending more time with Him, is being in community, is praying to Him, and is no, no matter what I feel, no matter what, um, is lacking or what I feel like is lacking in my life. I'm going to continue to choose joy and continue to have this this spirit perspective and the spirit be working in me and continue to call on him and ask him to be on the throne of my heart because when I do, then I can choose joy. Action plan two out of that passage is to present your request to God. But there's two things right after where it says present your, your request to God. It says with prayer and petition and with gratitude or with thanksgiving. Like the action and then the promise. 
And when I saw those two together, I was like, this is so good. Why have I never seen this before? But at the end of that, where it says, um, present your requests to God and through prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, at the end of that, he settles it with a promise. And he says, the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And if you look at that sentence, you see that it says, will guard your hearts in your minds. Those are the two weakest places of a human being because our minds and our hearts are so filled with things of the world and we need God's peace to protect us. We need God's peace to, to guard our hearts and our minds. And we do that by presenting our requests to him and saying, laying it all out to him and saying, God, this is what I'm struggling with. I'm struggling with anxiety. I'm an anxious person right now. I don't know why, but I need your guidance. I need you to guard me. And it's coming to him and being authentic and being vulnerable and saying, this is what I'm struggling with, God. And whether or not I am free from it right now, I just need you to know that this is what I'm struggling with because I know that you already know, but for me and for my own heart, Coming into your presence means that I have peace. And peace is what I need right now. And I think a lot of times as Christians, we think that, well, if God already knows what I'm struggling with, why do I need to pray to him? Why do I need to let him know what I'm, what I'm struggling with? And it's, the sim it's as simple as you're not going to God and praying and presenting your requests to him because he doesn't know. It's because that is where you enter into his presence. And the Bible says that when you enter into his presence, you receive peace. We have to choose to fight and we have to choose to even crawl our ways our way into his presence even if we don't feel like it even if we're like that is the last thing that i want to do right now i would rather go to a friend i would rather just suck it back in and act like i'm not struggling god knows that you're struggling and the bible promises in matthew 11 28 through 30 to come to him all who are weary and burdened and i will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn from me learn from me you can only learn from god if you're being in his word and being in his presence for i am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls this is my the most important part of this it says for my yoke is easy and my burden is light it's something that you might have to do every day you might have to do this multiple times a day and that's not that does not mean that you are too broken of a person that just means how much we need jesus and that is a great thing so the action plan two is prayer and gratitude one scripture that came to mind when i was uh, studying this is 1 Thessalonians 5 16 through 18 and it says rejoice always pray continually give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus there's another another few things that you need to notice here it says rejoice always which is the same way that um, our Philippians verse starts out with and then it says pray continually which it also says that in the Philippians passage and then it says give thanks in all circumstances. It does not say give thanks for all circumstances. It doesn't say whatever you're anxious about, you need to be thankful for that circumstance. It's not what it's saying. It says be thankful in it. Be thankful anyway. And that's a hard thing to do because that doesn't, that goes, it's completely countercultural to say, I am going to be thankful in this situation. I'm going to choose gratitude in this situation. And it's, it feels counterintuitive also to do that because every part of you, when you are anxious or when you are having just like continual anxiety in your life, it seems counterintuitive to choose gratitude. It seems like fake almost, but it's not fake. It's you choosing differently and choosing to, to live in the spirit basically. The last action plan, action plan three, comes from verses eight through nine. And it says, think about these things. It lists all of these things that you should think about when you are having anxiety or just like on a daily basis, what we as children of God should be thinking about. And it lists all of these really tangible things, but things that we just feel like sometimes we can't do. So think, think about things that are true, noble, right, lovely, pure, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. So we can only know how to represent a word of God if we know the word of God. We can only know how to represent a Jesus if we know the Jesus. So basically what this is saying is 
all of these things, whatever is true, whatever is noble, all the things that it lists out that we should think about, we think about and we, we know we have authority to make our minds believe and to manifest in our hearts because that is, that is what the spirit allows us to do. James 1, 22 through 25, going off of that says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the world, to the word and does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets who he, what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So similar to what uh, Philippians 4, 8, and 9 is saying is that th it lays out exactly what we need to think about. So it's saying if, if you are having anxious thoughts, if you are having um, lies spoken to you, you have the authority and the permission to filter those thoughts through the word of God. And I think sometimes we want it to be easy. We want it to just be like, well, I just say this one thing and immediately my anxiety is gone. That doesn't always work like that. We have to maybe sit down with a pen and a paper and write down out the things that we are believing or have come into agreement with that we don't want to be in agreement with and, and realize that they are not true. The, the action plan for number three is truth versus lies. And this is really, really practical. It's something that I do quite often in my morning routine is I sit down with a pen and a paper and I write lies on one side and truth on the other side. And I will write down every single lie that I'm believing. Doesn't matter how deep or how dark or how like often I believe that lie, I'm gonna write it down. And on the other side where it says truth, I'm going to write a truth, whether that is, I mean, I encourage you to find scripture to back it up or to claim truth over it. So like comparison, for example, if I'm struggling with comparison one day, I'll write on the lie side, um, I'm not as good as blank. And on the truth side, I will write, I am an original. And just simple things like that, it's, it's recognizing, it's not allowing these lies or these anxious thoughts to take deeper roots um, than they already have. I wanna point out too that twice through Philippians 4, 4 through 9, it talks about the peace of God um, or the God of peace. And I think that it's really interesting to note that he isn't just a God of peace, but he is peace, like in himself, he is peace. Jesus himself struggled with anxiety for a point in his, in his like journey here on earth. When he was in the garden of Gethsemane, he cried out to God and asked if there was any other way. And we have to know that, and I'll talk about this verse in a second, but we don't serve a God who has no idea what, there's, what, what, what we are struggling with. Everything that we struggle with, he has also struggled with. He never gave into the temptation, but he was tempted by these things. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. The passage that I'm talking about is in Matthew 26, 36-46. And it says, Then Jesus came to them to a place called Gethsemane, and said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch for me. Then he went a little beyond them and fell on his faith and prayed saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. We don't have this person, just this cosmic being, just sitting up in the sky who has no idea what we've experienced. He lived and he breathed and he died on this earth. And that is crazy that that this, this God who is perfect and he is sinless was here and he did the things that he did for you and I. And I just think that it's really cool to see even in that anxious moment, even in that desperate, distressed, agonizing moment where he said is there another way he didn't he didn't stay there he didn't leave it at that what he did instead was say it would be awesome if there was another way god is there another way but yet not my will be done your will be done anxiety will tell us to quit anxiety will tell us that it's too hard anxiety will tell us that we're not enough 
but in the presence of God, we're reminded who is fighting for us, what victory has already been won, and what freedom we have to claim right now. So I hope that this was helpful for you. I pray, I know, I pray, and I pray that if you are somebody who struggles with anxiety, whether it's chronically or just occasionally, I just pray that you take these steps, these three biblical, tangible steps, and you apply them to your life. And like, like I said, if you have to do it over and over again, do it over and over again. It's a daily battle. It's a secondly battle almost. But you have authority over the enemy. You have authority over this anxiety. And if you found this video encouraging, please give it a thumbs up. Just let me know that you resonated with it or let me know that you're going to apply these. Maybe comment down below if you... Um, have watched this video and you've gone and done it and maybe it's helped you a little bit come back and let me know your experience I would love to hear that or you can follow me on Instagram It's just at Lexi Teary to DM me and let me know that would mean so much to me Remember to love God love yourself and love people. I'll see you in the next one. Bye